Evans. I'm a principal scientist at Adobe. Uh, I've been there except for a short stint at Google for about 20 years. Um, uh, a while ago, last September, I gave a talk at Going Native, which was called C++ Seasoning, but it probably should have been called Three Goals for Better Code. How many people here saw that talk? Okay, maybe half, so that's pretty good. Um, uh, if you didn't, don't worry about it. But that talk, uh, I think, was one of the most successful talks I've given, and I got lots of feedback on it, and a lot, a lot, a lot of requests at the talk, in emails afterwards, for a book. Uh, so I decided when I get invited to go do another talk, I will write a chapter of the book. And so you guys get to see chapter one, said book. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I thought I would show this. I don't know. Maybe this might be a metaphor for the talk. I was out flying a little quadcopter, if you didn't see it around. Uh, uh, this is just a, about a 25 second video here, so it's really quick. Um, I thought I would make a really low pass right over these trees, and I missed it <laughs> by about that much. So the copter's fine. Uh, I have spare blades with me. It shredded all four blades, but I do have spare blades, but otherwise no damage to the copter. So maybe a metaphor for the talk. <laughs> so this is how the book is looking, to give you some idea of where we're at. So, so the title of the book, working title anyways, is going to be Goals for Better Code. And this is goal number one, uh, which is a talk about regular types and implementing complete and efficient types. Okay? So the talk, the three goals from the prior talk fit in here. Uh, uh, not quite in the order they were in the talk. In the talk, I gave them as no raw loops, uh, no raw synchronization primitives, which will become chapter five, and uh, no raw pointers, and, and which is really um, uh, about shifting polymorphism to point of use, was the third goal. So that's roughly where those talks fit in. Now, Eric actually stole a bunch of my talks, and so this is a talk about regular types. So if this runs short, uh, I might just redo the no raw loops because people seem to like that part of the talk. So, what is a type? Okay. Uh, you have to start here if you're going to talk about what a regular type is. Okay. And, and first you have to understand that an object is a representation of some entity okay, as a value in memory. Okay. And I highlighted memory there. Memory is incredibly important. And a type is a pattern for storing and modifying objects. Okay? Type is the interpretation of the bits. What do the bits mean in the machine? Okay? It's the structure of those bits and the set of basis operations that you can use to modify them to change from one value to another value. Okay. It's the physicality of these objects, the fact that they exist in the machine, that allows us to apply philosophy, logic, mathematics, and physics to computer science. And this is where I think people go wrong in their thinking. And I heard a lot of questions at Eric's talk previously that we'll get into about move and stuff, where people want to deny the physical nature of the machine, okay, and make things work the way they wish they were as opposed to the way they do work. Okay. So we're going to go way back to the primordial <laughs> ooze here. Okay. So a few years ago, uh, my older son uh, was at our house. He had just gotten a newly minted degree from Cal Poly in computer science. And we're sitting at the table, and my younger son had brought home from some camp he was at, one of those little uh, uh, electronic kits that you could get at Radio Shack that have like the little springs in the cardboard and a bunch of wires and a bunch of electronic components, and you can kind of build basic circuits with it. Okay? So I'm sitting there, and I pull out a couple of transistors, and I slide the box over to my son, and I say, here's a couple transistors. Build me an AND gate. Okay. 
My son stared at me like a lot of you guys are staring at me. <laughs> okay? Who here could do that? Good. Good. I think it's really important that all of you can do that. So I'm going to teach you how to do that. <laughs> okay? So the story doesn't end there. My son stared at me blankly. I told that story at a conference uh, uh, where a bunch of us old guys were having a conversation about the horrible state of computer science education uh, uh, in this country and how could we fix it. And I told exactly the same story. And Don Knuth turned from the table next to me and said, I would have stared at you blankly. <laughs> <laughs> So my son's in good company. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, I think it's important that people have a basic understanding. So, okay, a transistor, as far as what we deal with in computers, we can think of it as a switch. Okay, so collector, it's your power coming in, emitter, power going out. In the base, you run a, a charge through the signal, right? It closes that switch, right? So this is just a diagram for a relay. Electricity goes through, okay? But it's a solid state system, right? So the way that that actually works, the reason why it's called Silicon Valley and Silicon Chips and Silicon is so big is these things are made out of silicon, okay? Silicon forms a little crystal structure that has four electrons in its outer layer. If you mix in a little bit of boron into silicon, you, boron only has three electrons in its outer, outer layer and in that crystalline structure, crystalline structure now you have a hole okay where where no electron is bonded okay if you mix a little phosphorus in okay phosphorus has five electrons in the out, outer layer four of those electrons bind into the crystal structure and you have one electron that's just kind of floating around okay so if you stack these things together right you just mix those components and you stack them together then where the N layers here are touching the P layers, okay? The electrons will hop across to the other side. We've got free electrons on, on our N side, okay? Those are gonna hop over to our P side, to our boron side, to fill that hole, okay? Now, <coughs> that boron side has a negative charge because it has additional electrons compared to its protons, okay? That negative charge repels electricity, so electricity can't go through here, okay? But if I add a little charge to that P layer, right? A positive charge is basically electron holes, right? Absence of electrons is positive. Electrons are negative. So if I add a little positive charge to that, that counteracts the negative charge, and now electricity can flow through, okay? And if I stack the layers in reverse order, if I go P and P, I get the opposite effect and electricity can flow through normally, and if I add a charge, it stops. Okay, so I can build two kinds of transistors. They're referred to as NPN transistors or PMP transistors. Okay. So this is the answer that I wanted from my son, how to build an AND gate. Now, I didn't actually expect that he'd be able to get this far, okay, because he'd have to know a little more to know that you're going to need a little resistors here or you're going to get smoke out of those... Uh, <laughs> transistors. Okay. <coughs> but I thought he would at least know enough that a transistor was a switch. It has three pins, worked like a relay, and even if you think about just a switch with three pins, I thought maybe he would say, well, I got, if I have power going into both of them at the same time, I'll get power out the other side, and maybe try to give me just a one transistor answer. I thought he would at least know a transistor was a switch and try to reason through it. Okay. This level, I think everybody who has a CS degree better know this. Okay. So this is how you'd actually build an, an NAND gate with a traditional circuit, right? You can also build these things out of CMOS without the resistors, and they're, they're a little different. Okay. But here's a NAND gate, and what we're going to do is that signal off the top is going to get pulled low if both of those switches are open and the electricity is flowing through. Otherwise, it's going to get a charge going out of it. Okay. So that's a NAND gate. So once you got a NAND gate, okay, you can build a little RS latch. This is a sequential circuit, right? It's kind of cross-wired here. So if we feed in 
0 and 1, we'll get 1 out at Q. If we feed in uh, 1 on the reset, 0 on the set, we'll get 0 out. Okay? And if we feed in a pair of 1s, we'll get the previous value that we had put into it. Okay? So this is kind of the simplest form of a little memory circuit that you could build. Okay? Zero, 0, is actually an invalid thing to put on this, and what you'll get out is undefined. Okay, you string these together, those are a bunch of RS latches, a little additional dispatch circuitry at the top, okay, and this is a very simple memory register, right? We can put in values on our D lines on the top, and we have a write enable line that goes across that we can use to set those values, okay? So, with some additional control logic and a collection of registers from a memory space, and I'm not going to draw because it, it just looks like a whole bunch of wires, you get all the way to your memory space here. So all we need is a switch. We can build gates, sequential circuits, memories, processors, and switches can be built out of anything. Okay? I can build them out of relays, I can build them out of vacuum tubes, I can build them out of levers and gears, I can build them out of marbles, I can build them out of dominoes. Okay? It doesn't matter how small they are, it doesn't matter how many billions of them I have, okay? they are of the same nature. They are physical entities, just like this is a physical entity. Okay. So this is from Elements of Programming. This is the definition for a regular type, right? There's a set of procedures whose inclusion in the computational basis of a type lets us place objects in data structures and use algorithms to copy objects from one data structure to another. We call top types having such a, such a basis regular since their use guarantees regularity of behavior and therefore interoperability. Okay. So what do we mean by that? Okay. Let's start with a quality. And you'll see that definition didn't include a quality, but we're going to need it. And we'll see why in a moment. Okay. Two objects are equal, right? We would define what an object was. It's a representation of some value, or it's a value that an object holds a value that represents some entity. Okay. So two objects are equal if and only if their values correspond to the same entity. Okay. Okay, that's our definition of equality. Okay, it's from that definition that we can derive the properties of reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. Okay, those define any equivalence relationship, which equality is, but they don't define what equality, they don't define equality. Okay. So, If the representation of a value as an object is not unique, right? Let's think I could have, uh, uh, what would be, uh, a what's that? Negative zero. I could have negative zero as an alternate representation of positive zero, <laughs> right? So I could have two representations that correspond to my same entity. Okay, so, so if I have that case, then the complexity of equality can go up. In that case, not badly. In cases that I'm thinking of are, are a case where, where I've got a function. I can treat you know, right, functions, bits in a machine, a function is an object. How do I know if two functions are equal, so if they correspond to the same entity, what does that mean? It means that with the same given inputs, I would get the same outputs. How am I going to compare that? I can't. Okay? Or if I have two graphs, right? Two graphs are equal if they have exactly the same topology, right? Right? That gets to be incredibly complicated because I could be anchored, anchored differently on both of them. Okay? So, so, so comparing two objects for equality might be arbitrarily complex. Typically not. If your representation is unique, then the complexity is always just just the area of the object. And I didn't say size of because size of is a local thing, right? And an object could have many parts, okay? So, so 
I refer to area of the object as the local size plus the size of all the parts of the object. Okay, so because it's very rare that we have things that would take a long time to compare, the expected complexity okay, of quality is going to be O area of A. Okay, typically you can short circuit it too if things are not equal. Right, so because of that, right, you don't actually want to implement some, you know, MP complete equality, right? Right, you'll pose your users. It's not a useful thing to implement, but you still want to implement an equality of some kind. You can always implement a representational equality, which is to say you can always just go compare the bits, okay, and say are the representations the same? And if the representations are the same, that that implies true equality, that implies value equality, not the converse, okay? But for our use case, it's good enough. Okay. A copy of an object right, is a new object equal to the original, okay? And assigning to, a, to an object makes the object equal to what was assigned to it, right? Here's our axioms for copy, right? If I put B into A, then A has to equal B. Copies also have to be disjoint, okay? If I put, if I start out with A, B, and C are equal, okay? And D does not equal A, and I put D into A, okay? Then A cannot equal B, and B still has to equal C, okay? So that's how I describe things as being disjoint, right? So logically, right, copying my object shouldn't change something else in the system. Right? right? If I did, it wouldn't be a single thing, right? Right? It would be part of some larger thing, if that were not true. Okay. Two objects of the same type with the same representation are equal. It follows that any object is copyable by copying the representation. Okay? So, Dave Abrahams, when was running this conference more than once would get mad at me because I would say all types are copyable. It follows from the physical nature of an object and the definition of a type. Okay, all types are copyable. But I'm going to stick an asterisk on there because we're going to revisit that. Okay, so Dave used to threaten to get me a T-shirt that says I'm a regular type. <laughs> so this is only true for regular types because. But All types are regular. Well, so I, That's the point. Well, that's we'll, we'll get there. What's that? What about auto pointers, weird behavior on copies? Are you saying that's a construct or something else? Oh, yeah. So, so, so the question is, what about non-regular types? What about auto pointer? What about these other things? We'll get to those. <laughs> OK? OK. So a type is complete if the set of provided basis operations, OK? allow us to construct and operate on any valid representable, representable value, okay? So, so, right, my goal up front here was we want to be writing complete types, okay? So a type is efficient if the, your chosen set of basis operations to let you manipulate that, let you do anything with just those set of operations that you could possibly do with that value in the most efficient way, okay? Okay, so, that's what you're striving for. Now, by simply making all data members public, I'm not saying you should, okay, you would provide by definition a, an efficient basis for the type. You could go in and muck with the bits and do anything possible with it, okay? However, you'd be failing to protect the invariance of the type, okay? Yes, you could change it very efficiently, but you could also create objects that didn't represent anything, okay? So that would be unsafe, and I want to define unsafe, okay? Safety and validity. A safe operation is one that when the preconditions are satisfied, leaves an object in a valid state containing a representable value. Okay, 
So that's what a safe operation is. An unsafe operation may leave an object in an invalid state, violating the object's invariance, okay? requiring additional operations to restore the object's invariance. Okay? Now, a lot of people think that unsafe operations have to somehow be encapsulated inside the class. They can't leak out, right? But there's no reason why you can't have public unsafe operations. Okay. In fact, sometimes unsafe operations are required to provide an efficient basis. Yes? Can you spell out the difference between a basis operation and an operation in general? And an operation in general? So a basis operation is, is for, 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 for any type, type, okay? There are, there's some set of operations that you can define on that type. Okay, there could be multiple sets of them, right? right? But there's some minimal type that will let you get to all values of that type, okay? okay? To perform all operations. And then you can construct higher level operations out of those basis operations, right? So that's what I mean by, uh, by a basis set of operations. Now you can choose different basis set of operations, okay? And you might have different trade-offs, different inter interfaces. It's very rare that there's just one choice. So, if the extent of a type is not known either statically or encoded as part of the type, okay, then a quality and copy cannot be implemented as a function of the type. Okay? Such a type is referred to as constructionally incomplete. <coughs> Let's see some code so we can see what I mean here. Let's say that I wrote this, this little class here. This is my incomplete interray. Okay? I've got an incomplete interray. It takes a size, it's got my data, I do a new on my int there, okay? With just this, with no outside knowledge, I can't copy it. I need additional outside knowledge, okay? And if you see the little asterisk up there at the start of that first line, that was coming, at, coming back to saying, I said, you know, all types are copyable. Well, they are in a very conceptual sense. I can always copy all the bits in the machine, but sometimes I don't have enough information in just my object in order to copy it. Okay. Okay. If any value of an object can be distinguished through the public interface, okay, through the basis operations, then equality can be implemented as a non-member, non-friend function, okay, as a non-basis operation. Okay. Such a type is equationally complete. Okay, that means that I can completely inspect my type. This is a good property. Okay, so when we're talking about complete types, we want constructionally complete types, we want equationally complete types. Okay, and in fact, an equationally complete type implies it's constructionally complete. If I have enough information to look at all of the pieces, okay, then I have enough information to create a copy. Copy and equality are composed properties. Okay. So two objects are equal only if all of their essential parts, and by essential parts I mean the parts that refer to our value, not just to some piece of the implementation. Okay. So two objects are equal if and only if all of their essential parts are equal, and an object is copyable only if and only if all the essential parts are copyable. Okay. So this is when Eric talked about composability, okay, it becomes a huge headache when you have objects that are not, that are not fully implemented, okay, because you can't use them in another class, right, if that spreads, right, it's like a disease that starts to eat through your application, okay. So, just to reiterate, an essential part of an object is anything that contributes to the value of the object. So, I want to talk about functions here, because what has happened with C++ and functions upsets me to no end, and I stumble into this frequently. Okay, so two functions are equal if, given the same arguments, they return the same value, right? That's not good. Uh, but in C, we fall back to a representational equality effectively through identity, right? So I can actually write that line of code in C or C++, and that works fine. I can assert 
log 2f does not equal log 10f. Okay? That's really just taking the address and comparing the address of those two. Okay? But since my linker is going to give me unique representations, that's a good enough equality. Okay. Unfortunately, C++ function objects, including lambdas, do not define equality. STD function does not define equality. Okay? So this means that if I start using you know, polymorphic types like an any type and I want to put my functions into that, then my any can't define equality. Okay? So, so this is just a headache. Now one nice thing is that, uh, that I picked out of Eric's talk is, is he pointed out a little traits class so you could at least determine whether or not equality was implemented. Uh, and that lets you do a little bit of a fallback mechanism here. Okay. Um, uh, the other thing that you can do is you can check to see if the object is empty. Uh, because if the object is empty and there are no bits and they're the same type, then they're going to be equal. Yes? What's a practical use case for uh, having an implementation of equality on functions? What's a, a, a practical use case? Uh, so, so typically what I want to do is, is treat them as first class citizens in a polymorphic setting. Okay? So I want to be able to pass it around and I want to say, does this object, I don't care what's in there, is it equal to 10? Okay, and have that return, return false, right? right? Or, or, or are these two things equal? Right? Right? I want to be able to, to find a function in a, a sequence of functions. Right? right? So, so there are, it comes up in a surprising number of places, right? right? And it's just because it's everywhere else but not there. That's the problem. Okay, so let's go back here. Expected complexity of copy is O area of T, okay? Worst case. So let's improve our little, our little uh, incomplete array here. And we'll go ahead and we will write a copy constructor, okay? And now, you see, in order to do that, we're going to have to save away our size in here. And we want, to, we want it to be equationally complete so we can write operator equal equal, okay, th purely through the public interface. So we're going to expose begin, end, and size, right? There are other basis operations that I could, could have exposed. I could have exposed an index operator to say, give me, give me an element, okay? And then I could have written equality. Right? right, So those are the ones that I chose because they fit nicely on the slide. I didn't implement assignment yet. And I got two asterisks there. We're going to come back to that. Okay. Any questions on? Do you need all three of those for basis? Because you can derive size from begin and end. What's that? I, I don't have begin and end stored. Those are functions. Okay. I just stored size and a, and a pointer. I could store two pointers. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Do I need size? Yes. No, I could just say if begin does not equal end. You're right. Yes, I could just have begin and end and drop size from my basis. I could do that. OK. So I'm going to change gears a little bit here. This is where, this is the number one place where I think people go astray with regular types, and that's relationships. Okay. As soon as I have two objects, right? Two objects. As soon as I have two objects, okay, I have an implicit relationship. This one's to the right, to my right of this one. This one's to the left of this one. Okay? So, and in fact, right? The memory space itself, the room itself here, is an object. Okay? So as soon as I have one object, right, this object is at a particular location in this room. Okay? So as soon as I have an object in a memory space, I've got a, a relationship. Okay? And a relationship is not an object. I can't point to is in this room. Okay? I cannot point to I'm married to my wife. Okay? I can't point 
to Marshall is next to Kevin. Okay. Okay, those are all relationships. Okay. So, a memory space is a container object. Okay. When an object is copied, in a relationship that object was involved in is either severed or maintained. Okay? So, what do I mean by that? Right? I'm married to my wife. Okay? So, if I were to clone me, okay, there are two options for how that relationship applies to my clone. Okay? If I'm in the state of Utah, my clone is also married to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if I'm in the state, probably Colorado, at least in California, my clone is not married to my wife. The relationship was severed, okay? So when I copy an object, I have exactly one of those two choices. Either the relationship is maintained or the relationship is severed, okay? Now, a reified relationship is when we take a relationship and we create an object to represent that entity for that relationship, okay? So my wedding ring is a reified relationship, meaning married to my wife, okay? So as an object, it has all the properties of being a physical entity, of being an object, okay? But as a relationship, it also has the properties of a relationship. And it gets one more, okay? Here's how, right? So now I take me, I clone me, okay? There are three possible states the clone could be in. The clone could have gotten the ring, okay? And also be married to my wife, okay? The relationship might have been severed, in which case the clone did not get my ring, this was not an essential part of me, okay? And my clone is not married to my wife, okay? Or I'm in the state of California and I'm cloned and the clone gets the ring, but the clone is not married to my wife, okay? It's an invalid object, okay? So we may choose, it's a conscious choice, not to implement copy when the copy represents a relationship, okay, because it's problematic, okay? So, because it might cause confusion to the user if we severed it, right, right? You wouldn't expect, oh, I copied the ring, but the ring was not an essential part of the ring, so I just left a space over here where a ring could be, okay? That would be a little surprising, <laughs> okay? Okay, but because the ring represents a one-to-one, -one, couldn't put it over there, or I could put it over there, in which case it would be invalid, and that would be surprising, okay? So I might choose not to copy the relationship. Yes? Um, is it reification or more weakness of the relationship? No, reification. Reification meaning to make real. witness of relationship. It's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, I used it in the, in the sense of to make real as in to make physical. Right. This guy, yes. Uh, uh, could be a, a different term. So, so the, the question here, or the, the statement was, was is, is reified the correct term, or should it be witness, right? Am I creating a witness of the relationship so as an object? It's not just uh, vocabulary, because they come with semantics, right? If this is reification, then lots comes in, you know, to decide that it doesn't really make sense to define equality for Whereas if it is witness, then you can particularize that situation. Possibly so. So this the, the statement was it's not just, just 
choice of vocabulary, but the semantics that go with the vocabulary. Um, uh, and maybe I agree. Here? Uh, in particular, if the ring reifies your relationship with your wife, then if you destroy the ring, you are no longer married. Right. So, yeah, so the comment here was, if the ring reifies the relationship with my wife and I destroy the ring, then I'm no longer married. So I buy this argument, making Gabby's point, that the correct term here should be to make witness of. So, thank you. Good point. Okay. So I talked more, I talked a little bit up front about the book, and these were the chapters from the previous talk, right? And there's an overarching theme in this book, which is relationships, right? And the three goals that I had previously for better code are all about managing different kinds of relationships, right? No raw loops is about managing positional relationships in, in your application. So runtime polymorphism, right, and how I do type erasure is about managing owned relationships. Okay? Concurrency is about managing relationships between objects and threads of execution. Okay? So these are all places where you get, in, get into trouble. Okay. So a particular kind of relationship is a remote part. Right? So if I've got, right, this is probably one of the most Im important relationships we have, the whole part relationship. Right? So, so, right, you know, I got this as a whole, but it's got parts, possibly including the label, the cap, maybe we include the water inside, right? Right? So, whole parts, right? An object with remote parts, okay, now a remote part is one that's like heap allocated, exists outside the, the little local, local piece, okay? So, an object with remote parts can be moved. What do I mean by moved? I mean as long as I have space to, to move the local part to it, okay, I can transfer the relationship over okay, to the remote part. Okay. So any reified relationship can be maintained and moved. Three asterisks. I'm going to come back to that statement. <laughs> okay. So move an object by moving all the local essential parts and and moving the relationships to any remote essential part. Okay? So move, here's the, the semantics of move. Move is value preserving. Right? So if I have A is equal to B, and I move A into C, then C is equal to B. Right? We don't say anything about A, though. Right? Complexity of move should be order of the size of the local object. Right? Right? And in fact, Almost all the time, you should just be able to use the defaults <coughs> okay, for move. Okay, which the default implementation of move is just do member-wise move, right? Which for a relationship should do the right thing. So, but let's look at this in a little broader context. Let's look at what happens here. Right. Here's our new move. Okay. So we have two members there, size and data. So we move out of the data. Okay, it's a unique pointer. So what happens to the moved from unique pointer? It's nulled, it's nulled right? It's fine. Empty, whatever. Yeah. What happens to the moved from size? It gets copied. It just gets copied. It's left alone. Okay. So now if I go and I try to copy my moved from item, what happens? bad things. I'm going to crash. Okay. That's okay. Okay. A move from object is partially formed. Okay. It can be assigned to and destructed only. Why is that? Because it doesn't exist anymore. Okay. I took this, I moved it over here, there is nothing there. Okay. I can put something else here, but what was there does not exist. A move from object does not represent a value. Okay? Move is an unsafe operation. It violates the invariance of the class, and that's okay. Does this imply that if you have an assignment operator that doesn't work, 
on a move from object if that's invalid in some way? You, I can't assign a move from object to another object, but I have to be able to assign to a move from right. object. I mean that, so if you get that case wrong. If you get that case wrong, yes, and swap won't work if you get that case wrong. Right? <laughs> right? Okay, so does that make sense to people? See, considering the number of questions, I'm looking for hands here. Hand over here? Yeah. So uh, your position would be that it is okay to allow the so called emptier than empty state. Yes. Yes, I think it is okay to allow the emptier than empty state. I think it is okay for your non null, unique pointer thingy, whatever it is. To be so long as it's you can assign to it and destruct it, it 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 can be null. Yes. Now, I remember way back when we moved semantics, what is called the first one. Yes. Yes. Yes, but you can. I mean, <laughs> yes, and when you write them, always make your moves no except, right? Always apply a no except move, um, right? There, there shouldn't be any reason to do it. Go ahead and violate the invariance. Yes, vector doesn't work that way, and it's in, in some form of a valid state afterwards, but that's okay, right? You can strengthen them, strengthen those requirements. Okay. Okay. So, copy and move can be used as basis operations to implement assignment, right? Or copy and assignment, which I didn't didn't implement, right? So, this is filling in our, our double asterisk thing. Okay. Now, occasionally somebody will say, "Well, this isn't necessarily the most efficient assignment." Right? And oftentimes you can do a more efficient assignment if you give up on, on, on it being transactional. Okay? If an exception gets thrown partway through it, it could leave the object uh, 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 maybe in a partially formed state right? on the way back out. Uh, uh, it's fairly difficult to reason about code like that, and the performance win is usually negligible. So, so, and this is just an easy way to get assignment right. So I tend to write assignment this way. If I need a faster assignment, then I write a separate function, okay? That's a faster, non-safe, or, 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 you know, possibly incomplete assignment. Yes. How is that different from copy and swap? It's the same as copy and swap, right? I mean, it's copy and move instead of copy and swap. Yes. Can you get rid of the const ampersand? Uh, just make a copy on the. Of the sure. Oh, oh, have it pass by value and drop my move? Yeah, you, you I wish, okay? Um, uh, and in fact, I've given talks where I've said, said, you know, the only place you need the, 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 the double uh, 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 references for our values is in your move constructor and just do assignment as pass by value because this is a sync argument, right, right, to, to, to Eric's talk. Uh, the problem is, is the rules around auto-generating operator equal. I, if I did that, okay, then this object technically would not have a move assignment operator. Okay, so if I put this, Chandler. Chandler says, if you are by value move, you're move assignable and copy assignable. That is absolutely true from the traits class. Yes. But if I put this into a, a another class, okay, as a member of another class, if I put this class as a member of another class, that another class will not get a default move constructor because the language in the spec does not say if it's move constructible, it says has a move assignment operator with this signature. Well, the DR will, will fix it retroactively and fix all the compilers. Uh, <laughs> there is a defect on it already, and it has not been fixed yet. I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> okay. 
So yes, so because of a language defect, you can't quite do that. Just to clarify, is that a it may not or it will not? It will not to the current spec. But I think a lot of people think that that's a bug in the spec. Fix that, fix the compilers, we'll be good. Okay. So remember, I made this statement. Any reified relationship can be maintained and moved, right? I lied. <laughs> Pulling one of Chandler's lines, okay? Why did I lie? I'm in this room. If I walk out of this room, if I move out of this room, okay, I cannot take that relationship with me. I cannot move out of this room and be in this room, okay? That relationship, I can't transfer. Okay. So, have to qualify that. Unless the relationship is a part-whole relationship, right? An inverse of the whole part relationship. If I consider myself as being part of this room, this room's a container, I'm part of this room. If I move out of the room, okay, I'm out of the container. I can't take the container with me, okay? Biggest place where this is a problem is with allocators, okay? This is fundamentally, to John here, John is here, the problem with allocators, okay? Allocators within your vector, you have a, a reference to the thing that the vector is in, effectively, okay? Okay, and I can't just move that with me someplace else. And that causes a horrible amount of confusion in the language, right? Should vector move, you know, sh should it be a, 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 a no accept move? Well, maybe, but can't quite do it because there could be an allocator in there and we might have to degrade to copy, okay? So this is leaked into a huge number, number of places in the standard. My answer is don't invert the whole part relationship. Just don't do it, right? If I've got some allocator, right, something where I want to, to, to manage my objects, that is a data structure, okay? And I want to take that thing and be putting my objects into it, okay? Okay, as a separate thing, okay? So, so I need to step back a level, okay? Or if you can't do that, Understand that you have to stay within the whole, right? That the rule applies so long as I don't leave the room, right? Yes? You're essentially saying that the whole allocator approach is bad design? So, yes. My, my opinion is the whole allocator approach has too many detrimental effects on the rest. It is a case where people are trying to make reality work the way they wished it did instead of the way it actually does. So would that be an alternative approach to, to, to hold the, the, the goals for this, for the problem we solve with allocators? I'm, I'm sorry, would there be an alternative? The question is, would there be an alternative approach to? Yeah, what we want to reach with allocators. So I, in, in, in my opinion, yeah, I think we could have tightened up the definition of allocators and simplified it a bit, um, uh, not leaked them out, and just had the rule that if I move something to something with a different allocator, that's an undefined operation. Yeah? Well, I'm going to give a contrarian opinion, and I'm pretty sure it's not popular. I think the problem with the allocator, no, we have a lot of problems with them, but it is not unique, right? We said earlier that if, you know, if for example, I am in this room, if I get out of the room, then I can take the relationship with me. That is the basic thing, problem we have with C++. When you have an object, where it is vector, string, or complex or double, an object is a container for the value. And most of the operations we do, when we talk about variable type, they are about the value, not usually about the object. Yep. And when we get to the move, we get into this, situation. So I don't think the issue is particular to uh, 
uh, allocator, you just make it more visible. Yeah, so, so the statement from Gabby was that uh, uh, he doesn't think that the problem there is, is just allocators, right? right? It's, it's, it's anything contained in anything else, potentially an object inside of a vector. Um, uh, 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 yes and no, right? Because my object stored inside of a vector, right? I can always move that out of a out of my vector, okay? Which is that the 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 vector is only concerned with the with the allocation for the local parts, and the reason why that works is is uh, uh, is, is exactly that, because I'm only dealing with the local parts. If I move something out of a, 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 a list, I'm only dealing with the local part, not the, re not the remote part. It's, it's allocators where I carve up my address space and I get this notion of rooms, right? So, so that's the problem child in here, in my opinion. Right? right? Now, this is a bit of a digression. I'm not going to recommend this, but when our value references went into the language, and, and as we've seen, they have just a couple of use cases. Uh, one is perfect forwarding, which are technically really kind of not our value references. I mean, they kind of are, but they're not. So, so we have perfect forwarding as one thing. And then we have, have uh, 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 the cases where uh, 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 the only other case where we need an R, where we need a move constructor, okay, and that's the only, only two places really where we should need R value references, right? Assignment just because of a language defect, but we move constructor and perfect forwarding, okay, and prior to C plus plus eleven, we had return value optimization that most compilers implemented fairly well. Okay, so if I just had a little declaration on a constructor that said, make this thing be a move constructor, and I could teach the compiler to when to require RVO and a couple places where the, where the compiler, and well, yeah, if I could just teach the compiler when RVO was required, okay, which is pretty much all the places where it worked anyways, uh, uh, then I could write a move operation that just said invoke this special move constructor that just takes a regular reference, <coughs> suck the guts out and works. And in fact, ASL had a move library that worked exactly that way in C++ 98 and got you almost all the benefits of, of R value references that are in C++ 11. Okay. Now the one kind of painful thing is you had to move things out of functions to get that to work. Right? But there you're, you're really just, you would just have to teach the compiler that no, moving out of a function is defined in terms of move. Okay, now I don't think that C++ got moved quite right, right? Because we did this weird thing where we said we're moving this object from here to there, okay? But what we're leaving over here is some weird exoskeleton thingy, right? Right? It's not quite over there. There's some ghost of the object over here that we have to either be able to put another object into it or destruct it, okay? And Alex Stepanov had this idea of, of, of destructors that would cough up the object, okay? And I could never figure out really how to make that work, okay? But I did figure out how to make this work, okay? Which is to say that, that this is somewhat the same way that ASL used to define move, is we just have a constructor that takes a little tag. It's unsafe is just a class that's class unsafe, bracket, bracket, right? Um, uh, okay, so this is our, our, our unsafe move constructor, okay? So we're, we're going to do an unsafe move of all of our, our members, which in this case is going to be copy the size over, and for our unique pointer, I'm going to fake it out, and I'm just going to grab the pointer right out of that unique pointer, okay? So now I've got two unique pointers that point to the same thing, right? I just constructed another unique pointer from a data.get. That's a very bad thing. Okay, I'm violating an invariance all over the place here. Okay, but what I didn't have to do here is I didn't have to write back into that previous unique pointer the null pointer. Okay, I saved myself a write. Okay, 
So if I wrap this in a couple of functions, I can have a move unsafe, and now I can like write a swap that does three move un unsafes through unaligned storage. Okay? So if I actually want to, to use this to get a more traditional move, all I have to do is do a move unsafe to get the thing out, and then default construct an object back in the hole that I left. Okay? If I can't just use to line storage. Okay? So here's a swap that goes through and doesn't do any write backs. Okay, now, if this made my code run twice as fast, I'd be standing up here going, you guys should do it this way. Okay, so if you profile this, because all the memory's hot in here, and the compiler's optimizing a lot of this out anyways, so even in your best case, you're maybe going to pick up 10 to 15%. Okay, so it's not worth, re what's that? 10 to 15%. 10 to 15%, best case. Okay, so... You know, for example, right, the test that I was doing was like allocate a million of, an, you know, a vector of a million of our interarrays and reverse them, right? So it's going to do pairwise swap all the way down, this swap versus the default swap. Yep. Does this in any case be slower? It can never be slower. Okay. Okay. So, trims out a few cycles. Okay. So I think we could have done better. So, unfortunately, I didn't know this until things were too far baked. I did know about RVO, and I did argue at the Bellevue meeting that RVO shouldn't go into the standard, and that was when it was voted into the standard. I lost the argument, and, and uh, 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 the biggest problem with R values, references, in my opinion, is just too much complexity in the language. So, this could have been an alternative. Um, now, there are other operations on regular types. Uh, default construction uh, uh, is frequently very important. And, and, you know, I frequently end up where it's like, well, maybe I don't need the default construction, and then I do. And a big question is, what state should default construction leave your object in? Okay. Uh, my contention is that, that most of the time, a uh, zeroed initialized state is a good thing, right? right? A value state. Uh, partially formed is acceptable in rare cases. So if I've got something uh, 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 where I want to support move from it, but this thing always holds some, val some value, I, and I don't want a default constructor that could throw an exception, or to do a memory allocation, and I don't even have a good default value for what that would be, then I will provide a default construction that puts my object in a partially formed state, which means I, I have to assign something into it if I'm going to use it okay, afterwards. Okay. Representational ordering. Um, uh, if I had known that this was going to go this fast, I would have done more slides for this. Uh, we talked about representational equality. Okay. Well, if we can look at the bits at the representation of our object, then we can also always provide a representation representational ordering, which is just a lexicographical ordering of the bits of the representation. Okay? Now, I don't provide that as operator less than. Operator less than should be a natural total ordering. Okay? But nevertheless, having a representational ordering can sometimes be useful. Places in the standard where we already have a representational ordering, okay, that's not a default total ordering, um, uh, are uh, 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 things like um, type IDs, right? We've got a before function on type IDs. Okay, that's really a representational ordering on type IDs. Uh, uh, we've got, um, what's that? Tuple? Tuple? Mm, not really, it's member wise, but. Um, oh, what was I? I'm drawing a blank. What's that? Void uh, uh Yes, void stars, pointers in general, okay? And the hack in the language, not a, even a lot of people know this, right? Because if you compare <laughs> two pointers, it's only valid to compare two pointers to objects if the objects are, are, are of the same type and in the same container, okay? And, and, but people do it anyways, right? And no compiler on the planet bitches. The way you're supposed to do it is call std less. That's guaranteed to work, okay? Avoid pointer. std less avoid pointer is guaranteed to work, but not just comparing the pointers themselves. Um, but nobody knows this and nobody cares. But because of that, my recommendation would be to take things like 
type IDs and define, define STD less on type IDs even if you don't define less and use STD less as what you use for your representational ordering, which gets you the ability to put these things into sets and, yes? Well, wouldn't you say there's a total ordering on type ID, so you should just overload less? I mean, the operator less? Uh, no, because it's, there is a total ordering. I, the issue with it being a natural total ordering is that it's not a stable total ordering, which means it's not the same total ordering necessarily between launches of your application. Because frequently, it's implemented as comparing pointers, which it just depends on where they land. Okay. So, yeah. Re Yes. Yeah, so, so Gabby's statement was that um, uh, 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 some compilers do bitch about you, you comparing pointers incorrectly. I haven't hit it yet. Um, uh, and that, that, that in the past, people comparing pointers when pointers are wrapping around has caused serious problems. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not advocating that we add a less than operator to, put, operator to pointers, or that we change the current definition. I think the current definition for that case is correct. The yes. type info class has an object and then there are function type code, which returns, <coughs> I think, size t or some arithmetic type. Um, that has an operator less already. So could you, couldn't you just use that? Uh, so the question was, could you just use an, uh, uh, something that returns a hash code and do a less on the hash code. Uh, potentially, if you could guarantee no hash collisions um, uh, 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 on the thing, it would be better to use a full representational ordering. Um, there are some uses where you could possibly get away with it if you expected collisions. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so that was it. What? Just to be clear, you can use equality for pointers, right? You can yeah, we're talking about ordering here, not, not equality. Okay, but yes. Okay. Um, uh, uh, other attributes that fall out here, right? If I have a type that's equationally complete, then by definition it's serializable, right? I can look at all, all, all of the parts of it so I can serialize it out. Um, uh, I wish that I could say, therefore, you should always implement stream operator out, but we don't have a canonical format for what that would mean, so it's not particularly useful. It would be really nice if the standard came up with a canonical format for streaming objects out. Okay? So, so but yes, part of having a complete type means it's serializable. Just going back to the pointer thing, um, if you have multiple inheritance and you have two objects that are the same object but you're looking at different views of its base, like its downcast is basically heavy as a, um, wouldn't they compare to be different? So the, the, but they are in fact equal? so the, the question is if you were comparing in a multiple inheritance scenario, uh, pointer to a derived class, pointer to a base class, or I don't know, uh, 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 would they compare equal with equal equal, but not appear to be equal through ordering? Well, <laughs> Right. Yeah. Uh, th there's some exceptions to this, but they don't have anything to do with derived classes and base classes other than like, uh, like this pointer type adjustments. Right, so. Yeah, so Chandler's answer is if you actually do the comparison, it'll convert to void star first and then do the comparison. And that would convert and do the same thing? I, I don't use multiple it inheritance, so. Like <laughs> Chandler says it says in the standard is the answer to the question. Uh, my understanding is that the pointers could have different offsets in the multiple inheritance scenario. So unless you do a cast to the same type of pointer, you could actually get a situation where operator equal would return false when they in fact point to the same object. Right, so the reply there was that 
uh, you, because of, of object offsets in a multiple inheritance case, you could get two pointers to the same object where the pointers were not equal uh, unless you cast them first to the same type. But if you're using operator equal, then they come to the same type anyway. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> right? Look it up in the standard. I don't use inheritance. I don't care. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, hashing. If you can serialize, you can hash. That falls out. Okay. Um, uh, uh, area of the object here. I, I talked about about having an area of function, which I used, used in complexity. In ASL, in a few places, we actually implement that just so that we can test to make sure that our operations are performing the way they, they think we're performing. Um, uh, uh, so, so it is something that's implementable on, on, on any object. Whether or not it is worth implementing, I don't know. If it's testing is the only useful case I've, I've had for it. OK. So understanding the physical nature of objects provides a framework for thinking about objects and types. And I think this is really important. I think we get too hung up on, on you know, I want to move my object here, but I want to leave something over there that's still in a valid state. So I've got this object and some mystical object over here that's holding on onto the, onto the space. Um, uh, 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 we tend to create problems for ourselves Okay, by, by, in my opinion, exercising in somewhat wishful thinking. It's like we wish the machine was safer. We wish that every relationship was just maintained no matter what I did, right? The functional programming guys have, have gone down the route of saying we have no pointers. Well, getting rid of pointers doesn't get, get rid of relationships, right? An, an index into a list is a pointer. Okay, it's a relationship. It has all the same problems as a pointer to an object in memory. Okay, you have to manage the relationships kind of at every step of the game, encapsulate the ones that are important, okay, package them up in your object. So when you have these little things, right, if you looked at the rest of my talks in that outline, if you have these little things like iterators that are relationships, I don't want iterators flying around my application. Okay, I want to pass them to an algorithm, be done with them, they're gone, right? All the work about the iterators is encapsulated in, in that algorithm, okay? I don't want to be using mutexes and condition variables willy-nilly all over in my code. I want to build higher level constructs, right? I want good <laughs> futures, I want task queues, right? I want message queues, right? I want to package those things up into objects so that at each level of my system, I can reason about my system, okay? So, and I don't have to be afraid of having public functions that violate the invariance of my object. There's a difference between my object being in an invalid state where if I make any other call on it, it could be a very bad thing. Internally to the object, we do that all the time. Okay, we take an object, we violate the invariance, we muck around with it, right, and then we put them back. That's how we get efficient routines as, as the public functions. It's very nice if all of your basis operations are safe, okay, but sometimes they just can't be. An example, if you look at STD list, right, we built in sort into STD list. We built in reverse into STD list. We already had splice as a basis operation. Why didn't we build source, sort, as a general function out of splice. The reason is because it would be damn slow, okay? Because there's a much better way to manipulate the links than you could do with splice because much like move, every time I do a splice, I have to put things back together, right? And the way you're going to do the sort is you're going to leave pointers dangling and you're going to come back through and fix them up, okay? So that's why sort is put in there. If instead, if we had another basis operation like unsafe set next that took a list iterator and, uh, and I'm sorry, took a pair of list iterators and made this node point to that node, okay, then I could build sort and I could build list reverse and I could build list merge more efficiently than I could do with splice, okay, as separate algorithms. But those would be unsafe algorithms. I'm sorry, those would be safe algorithms using unsafe basis functions, okay? 
<laughs> I'm blowing people's heads here. Well, question over here. Is there an implication, if you have efficient basis operations, is the implication that any operations built on top of that are efficient? Yes, the, the implication is that it, the definition of an efficient set of basis operations is that you, so repeating the question, he said, he said the question was, if you have an efficient basis operation, does that mean that you could build any other operation on top of it and it would be efficient? Okay. Uh, uh, the definition of an efficient basis operation is that I can do anything possible with this object with a higher level function in the most efficient way possible. So that's the definition of an efficient set of basis operations. Okay. Uh, another question over here. Not completely, not completely, okay? So it's just like I had the, the unsafe move up here. Regular move is unsafe, but my, my move is more unsafe, okay? So just like I had, had the unsafe move up here or with the linked list, right, you, you want to select some basis operations. You don't necessarily want people jumping into the guts of your implementation. You want to provide a handful of operations and say, this is what this operation does. This is the invariant it violates, that, that it violates. And before you do anything else on this object, you have to restore that invariant, right? Typically using the same function, right? If I do one of these unsafe moves from an object, before I destruct that object, I got to put something else in there. Okay? Here, question. I'm a little bit surprised about that statement because it sounds a little bit like you're saying data encapsulation is bad. Uh, and, and, the reason, and the reason we have that, so the reason is that in, in our real world, we can't assume that people always understand all the details in their objects. Yes. So we have to be sure that they only produce those problems that are detectable from the outside. Right, so, so the question is, am I saying the data encapsulation is bad? And the problem with this approach is that uh, 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 you know, people can go muck around inside your objects and do horrible things and not know what they're doing. Um, uh, well, we have that already with Move. Uh, uh, I would I would argue, wait, I would, I would argue that no, this is not about overturning that. And typically when I write these operations, I name them unsafe, just as a flag. So, so you know, and then you just have coding guidelines saying, if you're gonna write it, use an unsafe routine, have somebody review it. Another question, or follow up. Well, having a special name for it is probably helps, yes. So, because it's, it's a warning statement, I agree. Yes. But um, I don't agree that we have that with MOVE, um, at least not conceptually. The, the problem with MOVE I think we have is that we don't have a clear understanding of what it means. So if we could all agree that after MOVE the object is only destructible, that's fine. If we could all agree that it's destructible and, and assignable, then also everything is fine. Or can we need more? Also, everything is fine. But the problem is that we don't have a clear understanding which one of these is, is right and that it is consistent over all places. So, so that's right. So, the comments he said he liked the idea of naming things that are unsafe, unsafe as a, as a warning flag. Uh, he doesn't think that necessarily we have this problem with move, that the bigger problem that we have with move is that people don't have a firm agreement on, on exactly what uh, um, a move is, right? And what operations are allowed after move. Uh, to answer that, the requirements of the operations come from two places. They come from, from the usage of, uh, of the operations, which is the algorithms, okay? And from the nature of the machine, okay? And the usage of these operations in, in the algorithms is in all the permutation <coughs> algorithms do moving. Okay, so we use things to move in and out of the container. There is not a single place in all of the standard library where there is any requirement from a moved from object other than destructing it or assigning another object into it. Zero, none. Okay, so those are the minimal requirements. You can define your move to do, 
You know, if you wanted to find your, your move to leave your object in a null state or whatever state, that's fine, but those are the minimal requirements for move in general. Uh, one more question down here. Let's say the only group of people that have issues is people who believe that you can do something with an object other than assign to it or destruct it. The people who believe that you can only do those things don't have a problem. <laughs> so the statement was, the only people who have a problem are the people who think that you ought to be able to do more than just uh, 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 assign to or destruct a move from object. Um, I think it's a little broader than that. I think in some sense, in a very real sense, a, a moved from object is equivalent to a null pointer in your code. And, and that gives people uh, 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 nightmares about, about thinking about that, right? You know, dereferencing null is about the same thing as you know, calling git from Eric's never null moved from object. Uh, 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 so, so I do think that, the, that, the, that the, the fear is bigger. The only place in my code that you will see me actually use move, because I do recognize it is an unsafe operation, is when I'm moving a sync argument into place. That is the only place where I will explicitly call move. Okay, so question from Gabby, I think, was next. And then I'll come over here. Yeah, so comments. Um, we don't have this problem with You can't even test for empty. So yeah. So Yeah, so Gabby's comment was he thinks there's there's partially tension because th we have this notion of constructors which place our objects into a a valid state if 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 I'm if I'm understanding him correctly. And so people want them that have been moved from to stay in a valid state. And that in the C language, uh, people tend not to stumble so much over this. Uh, my paraphrase would be because they're, they're mucking around with the bits anyways. <laughs> He's nodding his head in agreement. So that was a good paraphrase. Uh, I'm going to go to this side of the room to catch somebody over here. So two remarks. One is maybe what we need is a concept of a move constructor. So that we know that an object which has been moved from has been destroyed. It, 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 it would be nice. I mean, that's what Alex wanted as, as a safe operation of move, which is, is somehow have a destructor that coughs something up. Uh, Chandler has a comment on that, I think. Yeah. So Chandler's comments was, uh, they've looked at it in the language. It makes things uh, uh, potentially more difficult uh, for a problem that they already have in tracking object lifetimes. Uh, but he still thinks it's a good idea worth pursuing. Close enough. Uh, OK, 15 minutes, so over here. Uh, the comment was Mozilla's Rust language was built from the ground up with destructing moves, so it's an interesting place to observe this. So basically, if you move from, from something, the compiler will actually make sure you do not use the object except to assign to it. It will, it will get a compiler error if you can. Yes. So he was saying that the compiler checks it. If you do anything after you move from, a, from an object, the compiler will complain to you, um, uh, which I think is a good thing. Uh, Wow, too many questions, too little time. Let's go back to this side of the room, in the back. Somebody new. Okay, so two things. First, I completely agree that we should have destructive move instead of regular move. So I, I think 
I'm on, on board with that. But what I disagree with is I do not think that with the current implementation <coughs> of Moon that you should say that you are allowed, you are allowed to violate the invariance of your type. And to me, if you're claiming that you're allowed to violate the invariance of the type, you're not really violating the invariance of the type. What you're doing is you're weakening the invariance of the type. As soon as, as long as you have a structure version of the object, you should not be able to have the invariance violated. Right, so, so the comment was that he agrees that we should have a destructing move, uh, but he disagrees with the notion uh, that with the current move, a move from object should be allowed to violate the invariance of the type, and effectively what we're doing is weakening the invariance of the type. Uh, my counter to that is, is I define the invariance of the type, okay, to be, represents a valid value. Okay, a move from object does not. Okay, and so, so, so it is somewhat a semantic thing. It, I'm not saying that because we have provided this unsafe operation that anything you do is undefined, right? The object is still in a defined state, okay? But it no longer represents a value, okay? Uh, so take a comment on the side. I think if, if, we, if we use this physical model of, of the object actually being moved, so what's we, what we have left is not an object, it's, it's the space that was occupied by the object. Yes. If we follow this kind of line of reasoning, then actually we shouldn't run, run a destruct at all on this object. And the only thing that we should be able to do on it is to construct it, not assign it. Well, not, not really an object, but a space that, that was occupied. Yeah, so the comment was that, that if we do follow the model, a physical model, then a, a, if you move an object, then what's left is not an object. And I agree with that. I think our current move is not following, uh, uh, <laughs> is trying to ignore the physical reality of things, right? But we have the space of this object. Yes. This object was before. Sure. And this is uh, what we are doing now. We have lots of, mem we, we, we have the space, right, so the comment was we have the space where the object was before, and yes, we have the space, right, there's still, there still memory space there. It just no longer represents a value. It's no longer an object. But because of the current rules of the language, it hasn't been destructed, and so we need to leave it in a destructible state. I would, I would say that it's more than just the space. The constructor turns raw memory into an object, and the destructor turns it back into raw memory. If yeah. the destructor hasn't been run, then it is, is not just space. It is an object of a type. In a partially formed state, yes. <laughs> uh, I, we're going to run out of time here, so I will go. Sorry, trying to just pick new people. No move related comment. So isn't, isn't it a, an unsolvable problem in general? So like a careful um, choice of basis functions or whatever, or on basis operations. It's uh, something like uh, the, the choice of the DSL where the, the problem right. is nicely uh, expressed. Whereas the, uh, the, uh, the other thing is uh, making sure the basis operations are atomic. So any other operation is, uh, uh, that can be constructed out of them is as efficient is basically is the right. So, so his comment was was isn't the notion of of an efficient basis operation somewhat undecided, right? Because you don't know all the possible operations that you could apply on this object, right? Right. And so, so how do you know uh, that you've that you've got an efficient set of basis operations? Um, somewhat yes and somewhat no. Uh, uh, no, in the sense that I could always just provide access to all the bits, as I said before, and then by def definition I would have, have efficient basis operations, because I could do anything as efficiently just mucking with the bits as any other way. It would be very unsafe. Okay, now if you want to talk about the most efficient, safe set of basis operations, okay, then yes, I would agree it is somewhat undecided, and that somewhat goes back to why I call these things goals for better code and not rules or guidelines, because they're not enforceable. They are things that we strive for, okay, they are things that make our code better, but they are not things that we will always achieve. Okay, uh, so question up here.
understand is that well, the constructor creates an object. The constructor, so uh, the constructor turns memory into an object, but the constructor turns an object back into memory. That is the fundamental idea of what the destructive, a destructive move is. is it turns yes. the object back into memory. And by the way, first it puts the, the value that was there somewhere else for safety. Sure. But a destructive move is a destructive. So the view that the move should be destructive, yours, Sean, yeah. is basically saying, well, C++ got it wrong. And the only reason why we still have assignment and destructor valid for a move from object is well, because there's a bug in the language that forces us to do that. Yes. And so, so I think from the comments that were made, I think some people, uh, a few people got the impression that when you say, well, it's this move from state and it should have assignment and destructor should be valid, that this is a good thing. Instead of a <coughs> workaround. Because what you want is that there is nothing valid because there's nothing there. Yeah, so the, the, the comment, <laughs> right, right. So, so, so the comment, and I, I agree 100% here, uh, uh, he was following up from what Eric said, which Eric said that constructors construct our objects, destructors, you know, con constructors create an object in memory, destructors re turn it back into just, just raw memory. Uh, uh, and and that's exactly the point that we want a destructive move operation. The fact that uh, 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 C++ got it wrong and we don't have a destructive move operation, that after we move from an object, that object is still there kind of, means that we need this partially formed state as a workaround. And, and his point was, was it sounds like I'm saying that this is a good thing. I'm not saying this is a good thing, right? I'm, I am saying we got move wrong. This is a workaround, and it's the correct workaround. Okay. Uh, follow up from Chandler up here. Yeah. On the same topic, I would actually really like, I think, to, I'm not saying I like the idea, but I want to see a paper about this so that I can think a lot more about this. I'd like to see a paper which actually proposed destructive moves for C++, because I think it could work, and it could be interesting. Specifically, where moving out of an object did destroy it, it's no longer an object, it's just memory. And where subsequently, an assignment expression to that object, move constructs the way a placement new would. Move constructs or copy constructs? Or, or constructs. Copy constructs. Copy constructs. <laughs> right, so right. Move, just, just constructs. Just like so, so the comment from Chandler is he would like to see a paper that moving from an object would leave the object in a destructed, in a destructed state. But you would still be able to assign something to that object, but it would be defined as being a, a placement new to recreate the object there. And, and just to be clear, the reason I say I'd like to see a paper, I'd like to actually see someone, and I fear I don't have time, actually work through what the semantic implications of this would be, whether this could be made to work well with C++, or if there's some fundamental problem here that means that we need to not do this, right? Because I think we haven't, at least I don't think we can be really like, I know I haven't thought about this enough to come to a really clear conclusion. Right, so Chandler's comment was, somebody needs to try to paper so they can think about it more. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I think we just have time for one more question here. So I'm going to go with my friend Marshall, playing favorites. Um, I don't have a question. I have a comment, a follow up to Chandler's comment. I think that there's a fundamental problem with that because um, one of the fundamental, um, the fundamental principles of C++ is that we have variables with scope-based lifetimes. And this will break that and you will end up in a case where you have a, a name of a variable that is still in scope, that is no longer an actually a variable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, but it's not an object anymore. Right. Yeah, so, so Marshall was saying this violates the scoping rules, uh, which are generally a good thing. You know, things construct in, or things destruct in the reverse order they were constructed. Um, uh, uh, so that was his comment. Um, I think, I think that, I think that I, yeah. would be a big problem. <laughs> and wait, G Gabby said, I missed that. Gabby said he has a solution for this. Oh, Gabby's solution was to ban local variables, so we're just going to write with globals now and we're done. <laughs>
Uh, uh, Chandler. So Chandler's comment was, you can already violate the destructor, destructor ordering by explicitly calling the destructor on an object and then reconstructing a new object in its place. True. Okay. But what happens to stack unwinding in that case? I, if you don't okay. restore it. I'm not saying I solved all the problems here. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was, what happens in stack unwinding? I don't know. Write a paper. Figure it out. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I, wait, I'm restate that. Right. Right. If you don't know whether X has uh, that type has a move operator, you don't know what the status of that object is. Everything should have a move operator. So the comment was, was if you call std move to move an object, but the thing itself wasn't movable, so it degraded to a copy, uh, then you don't, you know, then kind of all bets are off here. Well, n not that bad because the the whether or not it implemented move, you you still satisfy the guarantees that you could assign something else into it and you could destruct it, even if you did copy it. Uh, uh, I don't have a problem with degrading to a copy so long as it's still a no accept. And I actually think std move should fail if there's no no accept move. It should just fail to compile. Okay, So move should be a non-throwing, non-resource consuming operation. Okay. So I have a strict move that <laughs> does exactly that. So uh, question back here. Right. It seems like it's either the same thing as we have now or very narrow in its applicability. Uh, talk to me about that at dinner. I think I followed it until your last sentence, and then I think I missed a point there, and we're over time anyways. So thank you. Uh, just because of the questions, the talk went as long as I was hoping it would. <laughs> <laughs>